Uh, my name is Summer Langstrat. Uh, welcome to our uh, presentation today on naloxone training uh, 101 harm reduction. We're so very lucky to have uh, Sam and Kira here today to present to us about um, what to do. So we have, um, they're part of AWARE, which is Alberta addicts who educate and advocate responsibly. So I'll let them uh, finish their introduction here and uh, enjoy. Uh, Kira, I'll make you the host now. Hi, everybody. My name is Samantha Ginter. Um, I am the team lead for the Red Deer chapter. I do want to make note that we have recently had a name change. We are now the Alberta Alliance who educate and advocate responsibly. Uh, we decided to make this change because some of the members within our organization did not um, they didn't feel like the word addict um, suited them. So we made a, a group decision and decided to change it. AWARE is an organization that is founded on harm reduction. So what that means is we meet people where they are. We do a lot of street level outreach where we go directly on the street and work with folks who use substances and who are unhoused. And we do a lot of education, such like this. Um, further to that, uh, we advocate. So we advocate for the folks um, who use substances and for folks who are unhoused um, to help keep them safe, help keep them alive, and help keep them healthy. I'm going to pass this off to Kira so she can introduce herself. Hi, folks. Uh, thank you all so much for joining us today. My name is Kira Dunlop. My pronouns are she, her. I am the Provincial Human Resources Manager for AWARE. Um, as Sam noted, we have recently had a name change um, and we'll get into a little bit more of that. Like we're gonna do a pretty deep dive into harm reduction, what AWARE does um, and how to respond to an opioid poisoning. Um, just to note, you know, like I am a human being that has, um, that is really, really privileged and fortunate uh, to be with y'all today. So I'm really excited to do this presentation. Um, and without further ado, we'll get started. Um, Sam, do you mind nodding your head to see if you can see my screen? Okay, cool. I just want to make sure, you know. Before we get into anything, we always start with the land acknowledgement. We acknowledge that what we call Alberta is the traditional and ancestral territory of many people, presently subject to treaties six, seven, and eight, namely the Blackfoot Confederacy, the Kainai Bakani Siksika, the Cree Dene, Salto, Nakota Sioux, Stony Nakota, and the Sutina Nation, and the Metis people of Alberta. This includes the Metis settlements and the six regions of the Metis Nation of Alberta within the historical Northwest Metis homeland. We acknowledge the many First Nations, Métis and Inuit, who have lived in and cared for these lands for generations. We are grateful for the traditional knowledge keepers and elders who are still with us today and those who have gone before us. We make this acknowledgement as an act of reconciliation and gratitude to those whose territory we reside on or are visiting. One thing that we do like to say is that land acknowledgements are important and they're a great place to start. But what's really, really critical is that we follow up our land acknowledgements with action, which is why we at AWARE um, like to encourage folks to go that extra step and seek out, um, seek out different indigenous led and indigenous service uh, serving programming um, within their communities to support. Now, support can look like many things. A lot of us think um, automatically that it's financial. Uh, you know, donations are super important and they do keep things rolling. But if you don't have the capacity to donate financially, um, you can always offer um, your time so you can volunteer, uh, offer gift and kind. So donations, physical items, um, water, juice, winter wear, whatever folks need. Um, depending on the organization, um, or you can offer services, you know, like if you are an amazing social media human being, you could offer that, um, or whatever you kind of have as that special skill. That's always something that we um, like to start off with. 
What is AWARE? So AWARE, as Sam has noted, uh, stands for the Alberta Alliance who educates and advocates responsibly. We are a provincial organization of people in Alberta who have lived, lived or living experience with drugs. Everyone is welcome, whether they are currently living with active drug use or working on their recovery. So what this means is that abstinence is not a requirement for membership. I'm gonna sneeze, I really apologize. It's passed, we're good. Um, as I was saying, abstinence is not a requirement for membership. Um, so folks who are in the, uh, who are currently um, using drugs absolutely can join and be a part of, and there aren't barriers. AWARE is all about improving the quality of the lives of those who are currently or in the past have used drugs. These members are also called peers. So going into a little bit of the history of AWARE, um, the group was actually started in 2004 in Alberta, in Calgary and Edmonton. Um, and a group of people who are working in harm reduction, you know, doctors and nurses primarily out of um, SafeWorks, um, in the Sheldon Schumer came together uh, to see if there was a need, if there was a gap in services for a group of people who use drugs led by people who use drugs. Their research showed, and they did this by asking the community because that is always what we recommend. Go and ask the people who are being impacted firsthand. Um, there was absolutely a need, a need through this process. Um, and they found that this group would allow the drug using community to have a voice, build community and support each other. AWARE began in the cities of Calgary and Edmonton. And since then we have grown with new, city, uh, new cities opening chapters and continuing the work. Um, AWARE, we were incorporated provincially under the Societies Act of Alberta on October 14th, 2016. We were formed to increase the knowledge of HIV, HCV, STBBIs, which are sexually transmitted bloodborne infection, prevention, risk, and reduction. Our mission is to improve lives through support, education, and action. How do we achieve this mission? Um, we have five pillars for our organization and going through each one of these is actually how we achieve that mission of um, supporting, improving lives through support, education and action. So we build capacity. We build capacity primarily in our membership, right? We offer different trainings and education um, and opportunities for members of the, the drug using community who either have lived experience, which means they used to use drugs, or living experience, which means they currently use drugs. We create a strong voice. So we allow people to share their lived, ex share their personal experiences, to offer different perspectives to members of the community. So, you know, our members uh, speak at speaking engagements um, to the community as well as to the general public. You know, Sam was a speaker yesterday at a rally in Calgary in support of um, the supervised consumption sites and um, to talk to our government about um, the actions that are currently taking place around those sites. We advocate for improved health. You know, um, a lot of our folks who are in lived or living experience have had really um, not great experiences with the healthcare system. So AWARE peers uh, use their lived experience to advocate for improved health conditions and improved medical care um, for our membership and for members of the drug using community. We educate others. We do presentations like this, you know, where we share what we do in hope of um, teaching, educating, learning, all about um, what folks go through on a day-to-day -day basis as members of the drug using community. And we get involved in the community. We conduct street level outreach. We throw community days. We do different volunteer shifts. We show up at rallies and protests and education days. 
so that people can know our name and know what we do, because it is critical that we have the voices of those lived and living experience human beings at the table when decisions are being made. Aware. So we are a provincial umbrella organization, and our purpose is to give voices to the members of our chapters representing represented within that umbrella. So AWARE is the provincial chapter uh, or provincial organization and then has four local chapters within it. Those chapters are uh, Grateful or Dead in Calgary, which is that middle logo on the bottom, Courage in Lethbridge, as it is in Edmonton, and Red Deer. We've just started our Red Deer chapter back in September and Sam is our amazing team lead. Um, and we're currently focusing on building our membership. When we have that level of membership, then we will, the members will choose a name and it will be put to a vote. It's actually not um, for our provincial organization for other folks to choose what the members want to be called. Um, one of the quotes here is um, something that's really, really impactful to me to this day uh, on behalf of AWARE is that we want all Albertans to realize that we, the drug using community, are people who deserve respect and understanding within our communities. You know, we're going to get into a little bit more around stigma um, and some fact and fiction and some myths around harm reduction. Um, but it's really important kind of to set the stage for this presentation from that lens of respect and understanding, empathy and compassion. Because, you know, we what we're seeing right now with the opioid epidemic is it's affecting everyone. Right. So our chapter meetings, um, we meet twice a month for all of our chapter meetings um, and the chapter decides what day is best for them. We have partner organizations that um, allow us to use their space, which is really, really wonderful. So in Edmonton, we're at the CHU Project, which is an amazing organization that supports LGBTQ2S plus uh, youth. In Red Deer, we're out of Turning Point, like three hip hip hoorays for Turning Point because they are absolutely phenomenal. If you want to learn any bit, anything else about them, please go um, to our website. They're linked on there or Google Turning Point. They do fantastic work in this community and they are saving lives. Uh, Calgary, we're based out of Community Wise, which is right downtown, about a block and a half from the Sheldon Shumir. And in Lethbridge, we're out of McMahon Child and Family Services. We are going to get into the philosophy of harm reduction. So what's really, really important um, is that, you know, thinking about harm reduction, we're actually going to switch our mindset. As a society, we are taught the principle of abstinence and the principle that, you know, sobriety is the goal. It's not. People can use drugs and still live healthy, safe, safer lives. So this is off the Alberta Health Services website and it is their definition of harm reduction. Harm reduction refers to policies, programs, and practices that aim to reduce risk and harm associated with the use of psychoactive substances. Harm reduction acknowledges that abstinence so absolutely no drugs or alcohol is not always a realistic goal for some people. Harm reduction is all about meeting people where they're at and identifying the goals that they wish to achieve based on their individual needs and circumstances. This is really, really important for us to acknowledge and understand, right? Not everyone wants to get sober and that's cool. They don't have to, it's actually not our call. It's really important for us as harm reduction practitioners to meet people where they're at and let go of those um, preconceived notions and let go of unrealistic goals or expectations for folks. What we want is we want them to live a healthy, safer life. And so that's what we're all about is reducing risk. 
we are going to go through some common harm reduction myths and um, facts, myths and truths. Now, these are all myths that I know I've heard um, from when I was really, really young. And um, we are going to kind of go through and talk about the different realities of what is actually happening in, um, in our province and in our country. It is really, really important to note that um, there is not a ton of data for Alberta. So when we're talking about realities and truths, um, we actually are taking examples from around the world. Alberta Health Services is doing a great job with their substance use surveillance system, but we don't have all of the data going back um, like some countries and some provinces do. So the first harm reduction myth, harm reduction practices, supervised consumption sites and policies like decriminalization will enable drug use. Who's heard this before? I have. The reality is that 23% of people who are interviewed for one study related to Insight, which to just do a little bit of background knowledge, Insight was North America's first sanctioned supervised in injection site in Vancouver. They set the bar. You know, Vancouver is um, quite far ahead of Alberta in the practices that they do regarding to harm reduction. And we absolutely, we love Insight. And a lot of the data in Canada does come from Insight because they've been operating for approximately 20 years. I can't remember what year they opened up in. Um, but regardless, they have been setting the standard for supervised uh, injection sites and supervised consumption sites. So 23% of people who were interviewed for a study related to Insight in Vancouver stopped injecting and another 57% entered addiction treatment. In Portugal, we love Portugal by the way, drug use was decriminalized in 2001 and their levels of drug use are below the European average. Drug use has declined among people aged 15 to 24, which is definitely a risk population. The rates of dependent drug use and injecting drug use decreased. Oh, sorry, pardon me, I went too fast. Um, but what we see from both of these situations is that instead of enabling drug use, uh, harm reduction actually does the opposite. Right, we are allowing people to choose their own path. You know, if they want to enter addiction treatment, they have the ability to. But if they just want to change to a different method of consumption, we will support that as well. And what we're actually seeing that instead of the rates going higher, they're going lower. Portugal, that has 21 years of data, is proving this, you know, with hard scientific fact. Next harm reduction myth harm reduction and supervised consumption sites will attract more people who use drugs along with crime into the neighborhood. The reality is in London, UK, there was no increase in the number of people who use drugs in the community following the opening of a medically supervised injectable maintenance clinic or in North America, our SCSs. Police figures showed that there was no significant change in monthly or average annual crime levels in the local area. In Vancouver, back to Vancouver, we love Vancouver. Among users of Insight, 71 reputed, uh, reported fewer public injections. So um, seeing people using drugs in public and 56% reported less unsafe needle disposal. One year after Insight opened, there was no increases in drug trafficking, assaults, robberies, and there was a significant decline in vehicle break-ins. So again, instead of proving, instead of um, the myth being true, so that increased crime level, it's actually proving the off opposite. Not that it's decreasing crime, well, in some cases it is, but at least it's keeping constant. And what's really important to note is that harm reduction isn't gonna stop crime. You know, we're not saying, oh, SCSs solve all 
crime problems. Like we could never say that. But what we're saying is when people get their needs met, and we can see this in Vancouver, when people are being taken care of, getting their needs met and um, being able to use their drugs in a healthy, safe way, there are actually no increases in crime. And in Vancouver, there was a significant decline in vehicle break-ins because people had their needs met. They didn't need to break in. This is the same myth, so that increase in crime. In Toronto in 2017, which is the same year that the SES in Moss Park opened, the number of criminal offenses actually dropped with fewer assaults and robberies. So again, we're seeing that when people are getting their needs met, crime levels either are remaining constant or alternatively actually decreasing. In Portugal, after they decriminalized drugs in 2001, the country saw a decrease in thefts from homes and businesses, which are typically crimes associated with substance use, right? People need to um, commit a crime to get their needs met, right? To fence items, to get that money. Um, again, we're seeing that decrease when people get their needs met, when people aren't in survival mode. In Switzerland, we love Switzerland as well. After heroin assisted treatment was implemented in Switzerland, this one is like wild. Home thefts dropped by 98%. Like that is a wild number, right folks? And it just really proves this point of instead of decreasing crime, instead of increasing crime, when people are safe and secure, they don't need to resort to that kind of behavior. This is my favorite one because I'm actually a business major um, and I like to talk about the economic impact of harm reduction. Myth, we're wasting taxpayer money allowing people to use drugs when we support harm reduction and decriminalization. Facts. Insight, again, Vancouver has saved the taxpayers of Vancouver $18 million over 10 years by reducing disease transmission, needle sharing, and encouraging safer drug use practices. Insight saved the taxpayer in excess of $6 million per year by preventing preventable diseases such as HIV infection and death. Once heroin-assisted treatment was implemented in Switzerland, HIV infection dropped by 84%. In Canada, Canada, the average treatment for one person with HIV per year is $15,000. So $15,000 for everyone who has HIV, if that number drops because people have access to safe needles, safe supply, et cetera, and aren't forced to do unsafe practices, we would be saving a huge burden on our tax system. So again, the myth that we're wasting taxpayer money, false. Because harm reduction is actually about increasing safe behavior, making sure that we are preventing preventable diseases, right? Making sure that we are supporting people um, so that you know, their, their health care doesn't become a burden on our system. If anyone would ever like to talk about the economics of harm reduction, I'm your gal. Like, I will do that with you all day. We are going to move on for a minute. Sam, do you mind if I ask, are there any questions in the chat box or are we, are we good? Cool. I'm going to take a drink of water because my, mm, I don't talk a lot in my normal day-to-day -day life. So like every time I present, I need water. So talking about stigma, words matter and matter. And stigma is extremely powerful. Medical professionals tell us that stigma prevents people from seeking help, from using drugs in the presence of others, from having naloxone kits on hand. It discourages supervised consumption sites from being built. 
When we are talking about stigma, we have to understand the consequences to really see what's going on, right? So stigmatization is actually the action of describing or regarding someone or something as worthy of disgrace or great disapproval. Using jargon, words like junkie, is dehumanizing and demeaning to folks. Using this language creates barriers to helping support and provide services to the drug using community. Stigma on the part of healthcare providers who see a patient's drug or alcohol use as their own fault can lead to substandard care or rejection of treatment. You know, we see this all too often when we are talking to folks um, on the street. You know, people who are getting sex awful treatment in our hospitals, in our emergency rooms, that they actually just don't go anymore. And we have seen uh, people lose limbs, lose feet, toes, fingers from frostbite or gangrene because of infections that were preventable. You know, uh, another thing that we hear quite often, and I would just like to put out there, is that people are accused of drug seeking which doesn't mean it doesn't happen, but drug seeking is when people go to the hospital, fake an illness or fake an injury to get the tiniest amount of drugs. I am just going to put it out there as a blanket statement that yes, this does happen, but it is very, very, very uncommon. The work that it takes to go to the hospital and, um, fake an illness or anything like that it takes so much work to go and do that for the tiniest amount of drugs when people can just buy that on the street they're not gonna do it if they are in pain they are in pain and we need to believe them because people who use drugs can internalize the stigma which makes them feel shame and in the end of the day they're going to refuse to seek treatment because none of us want to go somewhere where we are looked down on as less than. Stigma may enhance or reinstate drug use, and it plays a key part in this vicious cycle that drives people to continue to use drugs, right? How to reduce stigma. We need to do all of these things in all of our day-to-day -day lives. You know, we need to treat people with dignity and compassion. It can be the easiest thing smile at someone as you walk by. That smile can change someone's day, you know? Let go of your preconceived notions and expectations. Something that we were talking about earlier, you know, um, where we let go of that expectation that people need to be sober to be healthy. That's actually just not the reality. People can use drugs in a safe way and it's not everyone's goal to be sober. Meet people where they're at. Don't expect them the next day to wake up after having one conversation and be like, I've changed my mind. It's, it's not realistic. And we can't put that expectation on them because it's just going to hurt ourselves and harm that person because we're not going to be able to give the care and the compassion and the empathy to that person because they are disappointing our standards. And that's not fair. Educate yourself on current drug use and community trends, substances and toxicity. This is a little hard to do if you're out of the addiction sphere, um, but you know, there are a ton of different resources available online. Alberta Health Services can support. Um, Sam is someone who is just so amazing. And if you do have any questions, please reach out to Sam, um, especially in regards to uh, community trends within Red Deer, um, because Sam is like, on it. Sam's level of research is just wild. Sam knows what's going on. And we do as well, like all of our different chapters, because we're out on the streets, uh, you know, two to five times a week doing street level outreach. And if you have any questions, please, as I just said, reach out to local harm reduction focused organizations. Reach out to us in Red Deal or Turning Point right? We can support you through this education process um, and really suggest amazing trainings um, or webinars or seminars, or you can come and volunteer with us to learn more and kind of 
challenge these preconceived notions and expectations because we are all raised within the society where where this is what we're taught from a very very young age and um it's really, really important that we take that work on ourselves. You know, I had some very, very unhealthy opinions on people who use drugs, and I was one of them, right? I was part of the community. I lived experience. Um, so it's it's really important that we kind of, um, that we, we take it upon ourselves to educate. Um, last but not least, we can use person-centered language. This refers to putting people first rather than the disease symptoms or conditions that they may have. By using this type of language, we can honor, respect, and dignify people, right? It's going back to the start of the presentation where I said this is all about respect, dignity, and compassion. So for example, instead of using junkie, use person with substance use disorder. Instead of using the word homeless to describe someone, use houseless because people sleeping outside are actually not without a home, but they're without this societal expectation of a permanent four wall structure. You know, people's homes could be the shelter that they're staying at or Red Deer or Calgary or the province of Alberta. And it's, it's actually quite demeaning. That being said, some people find um, a lot of power within these phrases you know, within the phrase homeless, if they self-identify as homeless, I'm never going to challenge that. So it can also be a conversation that we, you know, if we're wondering what type of language to use, we can ask those questions. We can be like, hey, what do you prefer? And give that power back. How to work towards allyship. Now, all of y'all who are on this presentation and who are um, here chatting with us, uh, you are all performing an act of allyship by doing so. I think it's always really, really important to note that ally um, is a noun, but allyship is a verb. And so we use allyship. It's actually not appropriate for us if we don't have the lived experience of the group that we're trying to support to call ourselves allies, because we can always learn more, do more. That word actually has to be bestowed upon us by the group that we're trying to support if they choose to do so. And it doesn't have to be worn like a badge of honor. Um, it's a learning process. So allyship involves um, a lot of listening, um, sometimes referred to do it as doing ally work, acting in solidarity with or being an accomplice to reference the fact that ally is not an identity but rather an ongoing and lifelong process and commitment to action that involves a lot of work. So, you know, we at AWARE, if we are supporting a community that we are not a part of, we refer to working towards allyship or practicing allyship, right? We're not calling ourselves allies to a different community that we're not a part of because that's actually quite inappropriate. Okay, do we have any questions, Sam? How are we doing? How's the chat? Okay, perfect. Thank you for letting me drink water, folks. So, pyrology. Pyrology is a document that we at AWARE use um, that kind of cements everything that we do when it comes to peer practice. Um, pyrology was written by people who use drugs for people who use drugs and for people practicing allyship. Um, it was published um, in the early 2000s by an organization called CAPUD, which is the Canadian Agency of People Who Use Drugs. If you do not know CAPUD, I would highly, highly recommend um, y'all go Google them, C-A-P-U-D. They are doing absolutely amazing advocacy and education work for people who use drugs across this country. Um, so what, what uh, a Pureology was created to do was um, P 
people were recognizing um, that there was a little bit of a disconnect, um, particularly in committees and meeting settings, in medical settings, research settings, um, between the folks um, that the meeting committee research project was trying to support, aka the people who use drugs, the community members, and the actual involvement of people who use drugs. So this document was created um, to really augment that involvement in a meaningful and appropriate way. So we're going to go through the recommendations. Um, we're not going to go super in depth into them. If you would like a copy of Peerology, it is able to download off um, Kaput's website, or you can always reach out to us and we can send you a copy. So the first recommendation is give us the means, um, which means when you are trying to involve someone who uses drugs into a decision-making process, it is really, really critical that you give them the ability to do so. This could mean um, re-looking at the way things are structured um, or switching from a email to a phone call with the recognition that maybe someone doesn't have uh, available internet access. Include us in a meaningful way. It, is not appropriate for us to tokenize anyone. So if you are going to involve people who use drugs on a decision-making committee or a meeting or in any way and are discussing issues that directly affect people who use drugs, it is absolutely critical that they are given more than just a seat at the table. They need to be given a voice and support it. Keep it simple. Overly bureaucratic processes are a struggle for all of us, for people who have, um, who are currently using drugs or for people with lived experience, there may be some additional barriers. So it's really important that we keep things as simple as possible to make sure that we're supporting the inclusion of people who use drugs. Adapt to the realities of people who use drugs. You know, uh, a lot of folks who use drugs are living in precarious situations, whether that is in regards to their health or their income or um, the stability of their living situation or shelter situation. It's important that we adapt to those realities and we as people who have capacity have the ability to adapt um, to what the needs are of the people who are at the front lines of um, of drug use and the opioid epidemic. Always invite at least two people who use drugs to a committee or meeting. This could be for one of two reasons. You know, um, the first reason would be um, because it can be incredibly intimidating to walk into a meeting where you are the only person um, with your lived experience and you're talking about that lived experience and you don't have a support system and people, you might feel like people are judging you. Um, the other reason is, is because, you know, as we talked about in previous point, people who use drugs are sometimes living in precarious situations and they sometimes might not be able to make it to a meeting. So always make sure that there's always a backup plan. Highlight the accomplishments, achievements, and successes of our inclusion. It, right now, um, with the opioid epidemic taking place, it is a really, really heavy world out there. We are losing people every single day. And there is always this um, heaviness that comes with that. And so it's really important that not only are we focusing on using our passion and our care and our empathy to fuel our fight against all of the negative stuff, but also that we are recognizing the positive aspects of peer inclusion into meetings, research settings, um, committees, all of those different things, because it feels really good to get a pat on the back. Um, or to, you know, have your achievements celebrated. And a lot of the times we find that our, um, that our peers aren't having um, their successes celebrated or highlighted. The next recommendation is to take action. 
So as we said after the land acknowledgement, words are wonderful, but if words aren't followed with meaningful action, they're just words. Um, so it's really, really important that anything we say we're going to do, we do, right? Because otherwise, you know, our it's not worth our time to be involved if we're just going to sit and talk about what we're going to do, but that action never gets taken. And it actually can be very, very discouraging to folks who are living, um, who are personally involved. Thoroughly train allies to understand and support our inclusion. So this is what y'all who are watching this today are doing, right? You're being trained. And it's really important that we train um, any allies or people practicing allyship um, to really understand the realities of people who use drugs and what they live through and do on a day-to-day -day basis and how to use person-centered language and what stigma looks like and what the consequences of these myths around harm reduction are. Because, you know, we have all been in those situations where we are, our intentions are really good, but we just don't go around about it the right way. And so we want to make sure that we can kind of take that awkwardness um, and that possible harm away by thoroughly training and educating people. Recognize our expertise. People who use drugs are experts in their experience. Recognize that. Don't question it. Um, people who use drugs are on the forefront of this crisis. And um, that experience needs to be recognized and valued and um, seen as important to the conversation. This is my favorite one um, because I'm a really big fan of paying people. Compensate people who use drugs for their time. When it comes to committees and meetings and research settings, it is very, very common um, for everyone else at the table to either be on salary or getting paid and people who use drugs to be the only ones who are not compensated. This is not okay. We always want to make sure that we compensate people for the emotional labor of sharing their personal experiences, which is why at AWARE, we give our folks with lived experience honorarium for everything. If they are a speaker, they get paid. If they are doing outreach, they get paid because it's, it's just absolutely critical that we're giving people that capacity. Now, a lot of people, um, choose not to pay people or don't want to pay people who use drugs um, for their time because they're scared they're gonna spend that money on drugs. At the end of the day, that's actually not our call, right? We do not question how people spend their salaries. We do not question um, how, you know, normies, regular folks spend their money we should not be questioning how people who use drugs spend their money. So it's really, really important to kind of think that through whenever you have someone who uses drugs in a position where they are speaking or sharing their lived experience, that they are compensated. If anyone ever wants to know how much compensation um, and wants to have that conversation further, you can always chat with myself or Sam. Um, we are available for that. And it is important to note that in terms of compensation, it does not have to be, a, you know, cash in an envelope. It could be bus tickets. It could be food. It could be, you know, whatever. Have that conversation. Open that door. Gift cards are great. You know, um, compensation is absolutely critical. And finally, support organizations of people who use drugs to support inclusion. That's what you're doing right now. You are giving an organization that is peer-led and um, peer-based and peer-supported um, the ability to talk about what we do and it in turn supports the inclusion of people who use drugs. Okay, how is everyone doing? Sam, do we have any questions? I'm just checking in periodically with you. Okay, 
So mm -hmm. before we continue, um, it's really, really important that we just state there is a content warning now. Um, some of the topics that we're about to talk about, um, primarily drugs and drug use, may be activating for some folks. We do not show any open drug use. We do not show anyone using drugs. Um, there are some pictures of pills and powder, but other than that, um, we wouldn't include any like glorification or um, trauma into this presentation. But if you do find yourself activated, please feel free to take a moment for a mental health break. Um, this presentation is being recorded, so you can always check back in when you're when you're feeling a, a little bit better about talking about this kind of stuff. And so that's just blanket content warning. Okay, overdose versus accidental substance use poisoning. When someone drinks too much, we call it alcohol poisoning because that's literally what's happening to their body. They are be, being poisoned by the amount of alcohol in their blood and their bloodstream and their liver and such things. When someone takes too much of a drug, we call it an overdose. The difference in language seems inconsequential, but it says a lot about how our society differentiates between alcohol use and drug use. Poisoning is a diagnostically accurate term for what's happening inside the body. The word overdose means to administer medicine in too large a dose, which implies that a drug user knows what the dose is and chooses to take too much, which we normally see primarily in prescription, um, prescription drug users when they know exactly what is in their drug um, and take too much of it regardless of the consequences or for whatever reason. When we're talking about street drug users, because street drugs aren't actually regulated by the federal government, the province, overdose is not an accurate term right? Because no one can truly know what's in their drugs. And we'll get a little bit more into that, but it's really important that we just make that very, very clear. As an organization, we are moving towards using the term accidental substance use poisoning or accidental substance poisoning, because that's what's happening. It's an accident because we don't know what's in our, our drug supply. That being said, language Overdose is the word that has been used and that people understand and that people hear. And so we are trying to educate ourselves um, and move towards accidental substance use poisoning, um, but language takes a little bit of time to catch up. And so it's completely understandable if you didn't know this. Um, you know, and we still have some like awareness days that are called the International Overdose Awareness Day and such things. Um, but just going forward, this is really important. Overdose is actually people know what's in their drugs and they're taking too much consciously. Poisoning is when people don't know what's in their drugs. And it's what's happening inside the body due to what's in our drug supply. This implication of personal responsibility can exacerbate stigma, and stigma is all too real. Opioids. So opioids are a family or class of drug or substance that are either made from opium poppies or synthetically in, the, in a lab to have the same effects. Opioids are used in pain management. There are legal and illegal opioids as well as legal opioids that are being used outside of their intended use. Opioids bind to the opioid receptors in the brain, spinal cord, and digestive tract. Opioids are a nervous system depressant. People can develop um, tolerance, physical dependence, or opioid use disorders with prolonged use, but use of opioids does not mean that this will happen. Opioids can result in a euphoric feeling, a slow heart rate, a slow breathing rate, drowsiness and slow and or slurred speech, and constricted pupils. 
Some common opioids um, are morphine, hydromorphone, also known as dilaudid, codeine, heroin, hydrocodone or oxycodone, Percocets, methadone, fentanyl, and carfentanil. Now, when we put this slide in, there are some um, street names of opioids that are fairly common, you know, dope, China girl, greenies. Those ones have been a lot around for quite a good time, uh, for quite a long time. But there are other ones that like the names change on a weekly basis. And so by the time we put this presentation together and do the research, the names have already changed. But what's really important on the screen is this picture that we have of these three vials. And you can see that there's heroin, there's fentanyl, and then there's carfentanil. And this is the amount of a drug that is necessary for an accidental substance use poisoning that results in death. Heroin, you can see there's quite a bit of it. Fentanyl, there's not very much. Carfentanil, there is one teeny tiny little wee thingamabob. This shows how toxic um, the fentanyl and carfentanil in our system actually is. And carfentanil, just on a side note, is actually not meant for humans, for human ingestion. It is meant for large mammals. If you are a zookeeper and you have an injured elephant, you are going to give them a shot of carfentanil for pain management. It's actually not meant for humans and it is incredibly toxic and incredibly poisonous to the human body. On this chart, um, this is um, a look at the spike in accidental fentanyl related poisoning deaths in Alberta from 2011 to 2020. So as we can see, um, fentanyl is the most widely used street drug and it is an, a lot of different things. And we'll get a little bit more into that in a second. Um, but we can see that it goes from like in 2014, we had 120 accidental fentanyl related poisoning deaths. And then in 2020, we had 1,500 of uh, 1,053 deaths related to accidental fentanyl related poisoning deaths. Um, it is happening on the streets. It is very, very common. And it is excellent that y'all are here because this training could save someone's life. Okay, so fentanyl is a very strong, odorless, tasteless synthetic narcotic and can come in many forms. It can come in a patch, a pill, a rock, a powder, a liquid. Um, the patch, we don't really see all that much of anymore. Um, it is primarily for medical use and was around quite a while ago, similar to the nicotine patch, it's time released. Um, yeah, we mostly see rock and powder and it depends on the actual use of um, the drug, what the drug user's preference is. Okay, I'm gonna hand it over to Samantha. Hey everybody. So we are going to get into drug poisoning prevention, um, ways to use safely. So during the next few slides, we're gonna chat a bit about how we can keep ourselves and others um, who are currently using substances safe. Kira, do you wanna hit the next slide? Thank you. So using safer, avoid using alone. So one of the best ways we can stay safe is to ensure that we are using with somebody. This can include things like using the buddy system. So be around folks you feel safe with. And if you can try to stagger your use between the, the two of you or between the folks that you're with. That way somebody can jump in if a poisoning does occur. You can use safe consumption site or overdose prevention site. Um, those are great options as they have wraparound services and health professionals. 
Um, there's also virtual ones. So the virtual safe consumption services available within Red Deer um, are NORS, which is the National Overdose Response System, or DOORS, the Digital Overdose Response System. We will talk a bit more of those in the coming slides. And if it is safe to do so, try to make sure that wherever you are using that there um, uh, is access to get to you. So if you're using inside of a home or a hotel or things, making sure that the doors are unlocked. That way if emergency services or an emergency contact does need to get to you, they have an easy way inside. NORS. So again, NORS or the National Overdose Response Service is a judgment-free zone that is ran by the people for the people. This is also known as peer-led. What this means is that folks you connect with either currently use drugs or they have recently used drugs <clears throat> or they have some other experience with drug use. From my understanding, they are not professionals. NORS also offers an app that's called the Brave app. You can use this if you don't have data and are able to access Wi-Fi. NORS is strictly confidential. So when using the phone number, you will be requested to provide your address and other details such as who to call in case of an emergency right off the bat. And with the app, your information um, is put in before the phone call, but stays hidden until you become unresponsive. I do want to uh, point out that there has been some feedback that states if NORS cannot reach the emergency um, contacts you have provided, they will call emergency services um, to ensure that you are safe. The phone number is available throughout Canada and the app can be accessed anywhere in the world as long as you have Wi-Fi. Doors. So the digital overdose response system is Alberta based. The regions it reaches, sorry, the regions it reaches, bit of a tongue twister, are Calgary and surrounding rural areas such as Airdrie, Balzac, Cheadle, Chestermere, Cochrane, Dewinton, Okotoks, and Strathmore, and Edmonton and surrounding rural areas. Areas Around Edmonton include Beaumont, Bonacord, Calmar, Devon, Port Saskatchewan, Gibbons, Leduc, Morinville, Sherwood Park, Spruce Grove, St. Albert, and Stony Plain. With doors, it's run by uh, STARS. So you call and you are to uh, give them your phone number, your location, and some other information like how to enter your residence before you can use the app. Once you've entered your information, you can begin the timer. So the timer is set at one minute and you can extend the timer at one minute intervals for a maximum of five minutes total. At about 30 seconds, the alarm will start to sound and it gets louder each time. If you don't extend or cancel the session, a STARS responder will try to contact you. If you don't respond, Emergency services will be dispatched to the location that you provided. I do want to note that if your phone dies while you're using this app and the timer goes off and STARS tries to reach you, because your phone is um, currently not available to use, they will assume that you are in a medical emergency and will still call emergency services. So if you can, please try to ensure that your phone is currently charging or is charged enough before you start using the app. Method of use. So method of use falls on a continuum. What this means is that the route of administration along with some other factors will determine the speed of onset of effects and can affect the associated risk, risks of substance use poisoning. Please keep in mind, we are not attaching morality to the way a person chooses to use their drugs. It's all personal preference. I won't go through each one uh, too much, but I do wanna point out the route with the lowest risk is oral. So this includes things like swallowing, drinking, or eating your substance. 
this route does have a slow onset because it takes longer to reach the bloodstream and is also typically not as strong due to it being metabolized. The route with the highest risk is intravenous injection. So this includes injecting the substance directly into your vein. This route has a quick onset because it goes directly into the bloodstream. However, the effects of this way um, tend to wear off faster. Other routes are rectal or sometimes known as booty bumping or boofing. This is where folks may use their substances uh, make their substances into a liquid and inject it using a needleless, needleless syringe or using it by way of suppository. There's snorting, uh, inhalation, so that can include things like smoking or vaping, uh, and subcutaneous <laughs> injection or injection into the fatty tissue underneath the skin. Go ahead, Kira. Thank you. Staggering use. So we mentioned this a little bit earlier. Uh, staggering use is when you're with others um, and it allows you to attend to an emergency should one occur. So for an example, let's say Kira and I decide to use some cocaine. I will use a small dose first to see how my body reacts to it. Kira will wait, let's say 15, 30 minutes and she'll observe me. So this is also known as spotting. She'll do this, and then once, you know, both of us feel like it's safe to do so, Kira can then can go in and use the substance, and I will spot her while she's using. This is a good way to ensure that what we're taking and the dose that we're taking isn't going to um, cause an adverse effect. Test dosed. <clears throat> Pardon me. So start low and go slow. So if you can, you want to try and use um, a little bit of the substance that you have first. So this allows you to see the strength and potency of your substance, as well as how it reacts to your body. The supply right now is very unpredictable, and it's important to try and use the available options if you can. I'm sorry. Although this is a great way to keep yourself safe. It does come with its, its barriers. For example, we do know that fentanyl and fentanyl analogs are found in almost all substances. And because they are made in makeshift labs, most, um, sorry, there are most likely going to be hot spots. So what this is, is think about a chocolate chip cookie. So some areas of the cookie may have one or two chocolate chips, whereas another part of a cookie could have a whole bunch of chocolate chips. So it's important to note that this strategy, although it is useful, does, um, does have its barriers. It's not 100% reliable. Mind changes to health. So when your body changes, so does your tolerance. It's important to be mindful of your health when using substances in order to help reduce your risk of substance poisoning. So things like a new diagnosis of hepatitis B or C, a skin infection, pneumonia, even getting a cold, you know, they all have the potential to reduce your tolerance level for whatever substance it is that you're using. Further to that, it increases your risk of accidental substance poisoning. Some tips uh, to keep yourself healthy are staying hydrated, eating regularly, um, and trying to get sleep. However, we want to point out that for some of the folks in the drug using community who may be unhoused, this can be um, incredibly difficult. Avoid mixing. Okay, so it's important to be aware of how substances work together. If you plan on using more than one substance, try to find out how they can affect your body and what steps you can take to ensure you are staying safe. So effects of drugs can be stronger when mixed, which increases the risk of accidental substance poisoning. Some illicit and prescribed substances, if you have both, try and use one at a time. When mixing uh, central nervous um, system depressants, such as alcohol, benzodiazepines, and opioids, these can increase your risk of accidental substance poisoning when used together. 
Further, when you mix stimulants with the presence, also known as speedballing, can actually increase your risk of accidental substance poisoning. There is a, a common misunderstanding that if someone is using a downer or things like opioids and they take an upper, things like stimulants, um, it'll counter the other substance. But a stimulant will increase your heart rate and your blood flow, whereas the depressants will decrease. So they're actually working against each other. Some prescription medications might not mix well with illicit drugs, um, or they can alter the desired effect of the drugs that you're taking. Um, and if you're comfortable, and I really wanna emphasize the word if, um, you have a family doctor that you're open with and who is, um, on board uh, with your substance use, or you feel safe talking to, you can tell them about all the substances that you're using um, and ask for safer using tips. Your body, your choice. This is an important one to talk about. So, you want to take control of your drug use. This is an important aspect in keeping yourself safe. So when possible, try and learn how to properly prepare and ingest your substances. Um, we can refer back to the starting low and going slow. When you have another person um, preparing your substances, let's say if you're an injection drug user, you have somebody preparing your substances and you have somebody else injecting your substances, while they're injecting that substance, they maybe have, you know, pushed the syringe in a quarter of the way, and that could be enough for you um, due to, you know, the potency of the drug. But because you're not handling it, they're not gonna know. So you can't exactly stop that. And that could, unfortunately send somebody into, you know, an accidental substance poisoning. Further to that, you want to um, keep in mind that these types of relationships can, can have an abuse or power and control struggle when you have somebody else taking care of your drug use. So they could, you know, deny it, withhold it from you. They can use coercion, things like that. So you just want to be cautious about that. And when possible, learn how to um, prepare and, and ingest your drugs. There are a lot of, of um, resources out there that do go over how to properly do that. Know your dealer and supplier. So being aware of who your supply is coming from can greatly reduce your risk of having an adverse effect from the substances that you're injecting. What I've noticed is that dealers, suppliers, and the drug using community, they look out for each other. And oftentimes they will mention if uh, dope, as, what, as that's how they refer to it as, is either good or bad, has a high potency or a low potency, things like that. If you have a relationship, you are more likely to get a warning if a batch has been connected with a large number of accidental substance poisonings as well. So when possible, try to get to know the person that you're buying from. Get trained. Knowing the signs and symptoms of accidental substance poisoning and what to do if you suspect someone is having accidental poisoning, including calling 911. So there are many ways to learn about substance poisoning signs and symptoms. And by ensuring you are trained and having a naloxone kit on hand can greatly reduce the time it takes to respond and can also improve the outcome. Um, it's pretty simple. You can go to Google, type in naloxone Alberta. And one of the first things that pops up is the AHS website that has Get Naloxone. You just put in where you were located and it'll give you a list of pharmacies as well as a list of community-based naloxone providers.
the Good Samaritan Drug Overdose Act. So this one is really important um, to speak about. It protects folks on certain things, but there's a lot of things that it doesn't protect, um, protect folks on. So I'm gonna give you an example of how um, this act can work. So the example I'm gonna give is Kira and I have used some cocaine and Kira starts having a substance use poisoning. So I'm gonna call 911. With paramedics, police show up. I still have some cocaine on me. However, I have no warrants and I don't have very much cocaine on me. So they don't think that I'm trafficking it or selling it. So I'm okay. However, same situation happens and I do have a warrant. My warrant is for a seatbelt ticket that I didn't pay or a train ticket that I didn't pay. Now they do have the option to arrest me. So it's really important to understand that although this is a step in the right direction, there are some barriers. Um, however, with that being said, I do still encourage folks to always call 911. Um, you know, some of the ways around having police there is just to say, hey, there's a person here um, who's unconscious and they're not breathing. Uh, versus saying, hey, I have a person here who um, has recently had a substance use poisoning or overdose. Carrying naloxone. Kira, I'm going to pass it off to you. Great job, Sam. I, I love watching this presentation because I always learn so much, you know, every single time. Um, so carrying naloxone, naloxone training, let's get into it. What is naloxone? Like opioids, the molecules of naloxone fit into the opioid receptors of the brain. The naloxone molecules fit so well in our natural opioid receptors, those bumpy crevices on the brain, that they take over the receptors and push the opioid molecules that cause an overdose out. The molecules of the Narcan and Naloxone take the place of the substance that caused an accidental substance use poisoning. Unlike an opioid, the Naloxone molecule molecules do not cause the body's muscles to relax and will not inhibit oxygen to the brain. In the background, the lungs, heart, and other major organs become active again. So in your brain, you go into a poisoning, you get naloxone or Narcan, and what happens is those opioid receptors in your brain, naloxone comes in, pushes the opioid receptor, uh, pushes the opioids out, and actually fits onto those receptors. Narcan, um, is a nasal spray that does a very, very similar job to naloxone. Um, Narcan is harder to get your hands on right now. And the reason why is because Narcan is actually patented. So there is only one company that um, can produce Narcan. Um, it is a lot easier to use though, because we're not dealing with syringes and vials and such things. Um, hopefully the pattern comes up really soon and it's able to be mass produced um, and mass distributed because it's, it's so user friendly. Like you can't mess up Narcan, can't really mess up naloxone either. Um, one thing to note about Narcan is that you, if you have um, indigenous status, you are able to get it for free. Otherwise it's over $150. Who should have a naloxone kit? Everyone. Why? Because it reduces stigma. So if you as a human being who are not a member of the drug using community have a naloxone kit, it's not like a telltale sign of someone as a member of the drug using community. So you're normalizing it for the safety of the entire community. You know, um, at, no one is immune to our opioid crisis right now. No one is immune to the drug, the toxic drug supply. Um, 
then if we talk about toxic supply, you know, like we are seeing, as Sam said, we are seeing things being um, mixed in. And a lot of that has to do with where, um, where drugs are being um, created, right? Where they are being um, mixed and pressed and all of those things. So, you know, how we were talking about before, um, about how um, for prescription pills, there is there are federal guidelines that people have to go by. So when you get, you know, a 10 milligram dose of XYZ pill, you know that there are 10 milligrams of that ingredient, ingredient in that pill. For street level drugs, it's it's not regulated. So, you know, and people aren't necessarily as um, concerned with uh, the ability of keeping um, things uncontaminated. So we, we have people, you know, mixing different types of drugs and batches get cross-contaminated. Um, and the supply is just really, really toxic right now. A person at risk cannot use a naloxone kit on themselves. If someone goes into an accidental substance poisoning, they cannot naloxone themselves, right? And we'll talk about the signs and symptoms. They're kind of out of it, you know? And as I'm going to train you on, uh, naloxone kits do take a little bit of, um, do take a little bit of skill, right? We have to, if fill a syringe full of a vial and we have to make, you know, all of these different steps. If you're going down and you're in a substance poisoning, you're not going to be able to do that for yourself. And then one kit can save a life. Carrying naloxone is a super easy thing to do. How and where do you get a naloxone kit? If you need a naloxone kit, you can pick one up at any pharmacy in Alberta. They are free. One thing I do like to note, so unfortunately, um, there wasn't a lot of um, consistent messaging that went out to all of the pharmacies. Um, so right now, some pharmacies will ask you for your health card number. They will ask you for your ID. You do not need to provide this. And you do not need to provide a reason to get a naloxone kit. You can go in as many times as you want and pick up as many kits as you need. You know, I have kids everywhere. I have a kid in my car, I have a kid in my bag, I've got a kid in all of my purses. You know, it's really, really important that we start to normalize naloxone kit uh, carrying um, and that we all have one on us at all the time, at all times. Every Albertan is eligible for a naloxone kit. Kits can't be refilled, so if you do use a part of the kit, you can save anything not contaminated, but you will need to get a full new kit. It is free. Just go to your pharmacy, be like, hi, I need an naloxone kit, and they'll give it to you. If you don't want to put it on your, like, if you don't want to give ID, you don't have to give ID, and you can be like, actually, no, I just need the kit. What do you need to know about naloxone? It temporarily blocks the effect of opioids. The effects of naloxone do wear off within 20 to 90 minutes, so it is really critical to call 911 ASAP. Um, you can slip back into an accidental substance poisoning once naloxone wears off. So what an accidental, so this is actually called a secondary poisoning. Um, and what happens is, so the naloxone uh, molecules are on your opioid receptors in your brain. The effects last for 20 to 90 minutes. That's a really varied amount of time. So when the naloxone starts to wear off, the opioid molecules are still in your body and they can actually go back up to your brain and hook back into those opioid receptors and make you go into a poisoning again. So it's really, really critical that like, as soon as you admit, like you are on the phone with 911 because EMS can, um, can support uh, that person um, if they go into a secondary poisoning. But we'll talk a little bit more about that in a bit. Naloxone will not harm someone who is not accidentally poisoned. I could, I could inject myself with naloxone right now and nothing would happen. 
it is 100% safe. Well, I mean, I would be sore where I injected myself, but other than that, it's 100% safe. Naloxone works in two to five minutes. It is available in injectable and intranasal form. So injectable is what I'm going to train y'all on today. And the intranasal form is actually, is that Narcan spray that um, I showed you a picture of. It should be stored, uh, naloxone kits should be stored between 50 to 15 to 30 degrees Celsius and protected from light. That being said, we live in Alberta, <laughs> you know, it is, uh, I mean, I think there's like, three weeks where it's between 15 and 30 degrees. Other than that, like year round, we're always outside of that range. Um, you know, like as much as you possibly can, please try to protect your naloxone kits. That being said, if you have a naloxone kit that maybe was in your car overnight and it got down below zero and it's really cold and it's all you have, use it. Okay, there's nothing that's going to be, it's just not going to be as effective, but if it's all you have, you are going to use it because there is the potential to save someone's life. There are also expiry dates on naloxone kits. Um, mine right now, if you look at the back, you can see where, uh, Lord, I'm on a new computer. You can see that expiry date right there. That's the right way. So this is good until 2024. March 2024. Again, if you use an expired kit, it's not the end of the world. It's just not going to be as effective. So you might actually need to use more naloxone. Responding to an opioid poisoning. Knowing the signs. The signs are super important. Um, you know, and it's really important for me to note that um, everyone's going to be a little different. This is not something that's across the board. You're going to see all six of these signs and you're going to be like, opioid poisoning. And if you don't see all six of these signs, you're like, that's not an opioid poisoning. It really depends on the person, their physiology, their how much of the drug they took, what who they are, how their body responds, etc. These are some of the signs. They're not responding. Their breath is slow or they are not breathing. So, you know, a breath every five seconds is pretty normal. Um, if they're like breathing every like 10, 15 seconds, that's a really telltale sign. They're making sound. So they're chirkling, uh, ch chirkling, choking, gurgling, snoring. Like it's, it's a very guttural sound and it doesn't sound like anything you've really heard before, um, that would be a really telltale sign. Um, on Caucasian folks, blue lips and nails. On people of color, uh, nail beds and lips might go white, um, which is about blood flow, right? Cold or clammy skin and tiny pupils. Now for myself, I'm actually going to walk you through exactly how I would respond to um, an opioid poisoning. Um, I'm not going to go up to someone who is unresponsive and open their eye to check their pupils. I'm not going to do that. Uh, just because there are other steps that I'm gonna take first um, before I'm like, oh, let me check the eye. It's, it's just to me, I'm like, I would not want someone touching my, touching my face if I was just like in a really deep snooze. So that's not gonna be my first step. Just a note. Okay, naloxone training. I'm going to stop sharing my screen so y'all can see um, the big video of me actually teaching you how I would do this. Hi, yay, okay. So you are walking downtown right here and you see someone and they are slumped over and you're worried they're gonna go into a poisoning. What you're going to do, and I'm just going to walk you through exactly how I would do this, and it is really important to note that we are not medical professionals. You know, we are community members. We are people who are doing this work, but we're not doctors. We're not nurses. We're just human beings, um, so we don't have any special training. Um, we just uh, have learned through lived experience and trainings that we have done on our own time. So, we come up to a human being, we're like, oh no, 
I think this person might be in a substance use, uh, might be in a substance poisoning. First thing I'm going to do always is I'm going to look around me. I'm going to look around their body and see if there's any visible hazards. Are there any discarded uh, sharps, so needles? Um, or is there glass? Is there something that I could harm myself on? You know, maybe you're going to take off your coat and you're going to kneel on the coat. Um, maybe you're going to do that, but always make sure to take care of your safety as well. Um, the next thing I, I do is I talk to people, right? I'm going to go up and I'm going to be like, hey, friend, my name's Kira. I'm worried you might be in a substance poisoning. Are you okay? I'm going to talk to them. If their friends are around, because there's the possibility that they might be, and just let them know. Let them know. Say, hey, I'm actually worried that this person is in a substance poisoning. I am going to try and wake them up. If I cannot, I will be administering the naloxone. It is not a bad idea to talk yourself through this and to talk to the person who is in the poisoning. Because, you know, I believe that at some subconscious some level, they can hear you and they can hear your voice. If they're just snoozing, you know, maybe your voice will wake them up. And then I'll go over it and I'll gently kick their foot. And then maybe I'll cook, uh, kick their foot a little harder. Like just that, that motion to see if you can wake them up from that poisoning. And be like, hey friend, you know, I'm really worried about you. Are you in a substance use, like, are you in a substance poisoning? I, I just need to, you know, if you're awake, let me know. And then you're going, if you still don't get any response and they're doing any of those signs, if you can't see breathing, if, you know, you see the blue or white nails or lips, if they're making an, a gnarly sound in their throat, you're going to go ahead and you're going to administer naloxone. As I said before, naloxone isn't ever going to harm anyone. So if it's ever in doubt in your mind, do it. Don't hesitate, just do it because we want to get as much, we want to do it as soon as possible uh, to make sure that if we can, we can save this person's life. So this is your naloxone kit. Looks like this. There is actually a QR code right here and it's for the Doors app that Sam was talking about. So if you are the one using, you can use this QR code and I'll take you straight to the Doors app. Fun fact. In the naloxone kit, you're gonna have a couple different things. You're gonna have your vial of naloxone. You're gonna have some syringes. You get three vials, three syringes, a pair of gloves, a rescue breathing mask, and a little guide on how to respond to an opioid poisoning with naloxone. This is going to be your best friend, especially if. Um, especially if this is your first time, if you're nervous, if you're worried, this is what's going to walk you through because it is, it is fail safe. It is literally goes through the steps. So step one is look for signs of an opioid poisoning, right? So we've already walked around them. We've been like, Hey friend, you know, I'm worried about you. Can you let me know if you're okay? They don't respond, kick their foot, nudge them. You know, obviously don't harm them, but something that would just jar someone out of a deep sleep, right? And then you're going to, it says check for response. So speak loudly. It also says to rub your fist um, on the middle of your, on the chest of the sternum. I'm not going to do that, um, especially for femme folks. Um, but for anyone, that's a really vulnerable place. If you, if I were to wake up from a really deep sleep and someone has a fist on my chest, it is so vulnerable and it would um, really concern me. So what I am actually going to do is something that our provincial communications manager, Marie, calls the death grip. And so you go like this, you put your fingers together, you make a claw and you actually grab right here in the collarbone area and you're going to squeeze hard. It's going to wake someone up. If they're taking a snooze, 
that will wake someone up. You don't have to get up in the chest. You just don't have to do that. If there is no response still, you're gonna call 911 and you're going to proceed to administer naloxone. When you are on the phone with 911, if you have a partner, if you have a friend there with you, so say it's Sam and I, I'm gonna be like, hey Sam, I'm about to administer naloxone. I need you to get on the phone with 911. As Sam mentioned before, you know, um, the minute that you say uh, substance, uh, substance poisoning or overdose on the phone, automatically the police are going to be called. We can't tell you what to do. Um, if you say those words and the police show up, that's just what it is. The most important thing is that EMS is on their way because EMS has the skills and the training um, to support that person after you have administered the first dose, uh, first doses. You are going to check then when Sam is on the phone with 911, I'm gonna check if they're breathing. If I am alone, I am going to call 911 and I'm going to put the phone on speakerphone. I'm going to put it beside me and I'm going to talk to them. I'm going to be like, this is what I'm doing. All this time, we're still talking to this human. We're still like, hey, I'm going to do the death grip on you. I'm going to touch your collarbone. Hey, I'm going to check if you're breathing. The, um, the naloxone kit comes with this face shield and it's super, super easy. Like it's got instructions on it. So again, this is um, pretty fail safe or pretty foolproof, let's say. That being said, one thing um, that Alberta's health services did know now that we're in a global pandemic is this failed to, a face shield is not going to protect you from COVID. So you are actually well within your rights um, to not use it because it would be putting yourself at risk. And, you know, if it's someone I didn't know, I probably wouldn't give them rescue breathing. If it's Sam, I'm, I would give rescue breathing, right? If it's someone, if it's one of my people that I know, I would, but I just don't feel comfortable to. Once, you know, we kind of see where COVID goes, um, we can reassess how our comfort level is. This will not protect you from COVID. If you do decide to give rescue breathing, it says this side up. You're gonna put this in the person's mouth. You're gonna breathe through this. You're gonna tilt the patient's head backward, pinch their nose, insert the device into their mouth. And then you're going to give rescue breath. Rescue breath is every five seconds and is a total of 24 breaths for every two minutes, uh, per two minutes. Um, you know, there are, and it, tells you how to do rescue breathing. That's very fun. Um, there, you know, for some courses like CPR does teach naloxone training. We actually aren't medical professionals, so we can't tell you um, how to do CPR. It's not within our scope. And the worst thing possible would be if we told you how to do it wrong. Um, so it's really important that um, if you feel comfortable to do rescue breathing, you do. If you don't, that's okay. You're gonna proceed with naloxone. Before we do anything with naloxone, we are going to put on our gloves, okay? Gloves, super important, super, super important. Um, this is for our own protection and the protection of the human being. Gloves are cool, plus they're blue. You are going to, where is my little vial? This vial, this is a vial of naloxone. There is a cap on here. You're gonna take off the cap. And then as you can see on the vial, that way, this little gray part, it's rubber. That is where you're gonna stick the syringe through. Vial. Now, one of our like insider tips and tricks, I don't know if it's actually insider, but this is what we do. On the naloxone bottle, there's this label. And in this label, uh, on this label, there's this little gap and you can actually see how much naloxone is in the vial. This is really helpful for when you're actually, uh, when you've inserted your syringe um, because it tells you where the air pocket is. And I will explain that in a second. It's also going to tell you how much naloxone there is left. 
So you're going to take your syringe. You are going to remove the cap. And then you are going to, if you go like this, you're going to pierce that little gray rubber thingamabob and you're going to insert your syringe. Now, when we're talking about an air pocket, if you push the syringe all the way in, you're not going to be able to pull any naloxone out. You can literally like, we no naloxone. It's all air, which is why that little uh, thing, like that little break between the sticker is really important. So you're actually going to pull your syringe down so that the tip is in the naloxone. And you can take a look. Oh, sorry, it's being a little tricky for me right now. There we go. And you are going to fill your syringe. Oh, I'm sorry, I messed up. There we go. And you are going to fill your syringe. Now you can insert this into someone's um, arm, someone's butt or someone's thigh. Thigh is always easiest for me. And you're gonna talk to the person all through this. You're gonna be like, hey friend, I'm about to inject you with naloxone. Now I don't have my injection pads. <laughs> um, Marie has them at her home. So I'm gonna use this water bottle. And what you're going to do is you're going to come straight down and you're going to inject and then you're going to go bam into them. Now what you're going to see is these needles are actually safety needles. So what that means is that the sharp, once it has been removed from the body, is actually going to shoot back up into the needle so there is no sharp. And then you're going to wait. You're going to wait about a minute and a half. When someone comes out of a naloxone, uh, when someone comes out of a substance poisoning, um, it can be kind of like someone wakes from the dead. You know, they could be like, <gasps> and come back. That being said, with the toxicity of the drugs that we are seeing currently on the street, um, we are using more and more naloxone to pull people out of poisonings. So you're gonna wait about a minute, a minute and a half. You're going to continue rescue breathing if you are comfortable to do so. If you are not comfortable to do so, um, you're just gonna wait a minute, a minute and a half. You're gonna chat with that human being. You're gonna be like, hey friend, are you, can you hear me? Are you waking up? Do, 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 do. After a minute to a minute and a half, you know, and they're not waking up, you're gonna do it all again. You're gonna prepare your syringe again. You're gonna look at your naloxone. You're gonna be like, okay, this is, you know, pulling my, pulling my naloxone in. At two minutes, you're gonna inject them again. And you're just gonna keep going until they wake up or EMS arrives. You cannot give someone too much naloxone. It is not going to harm them. It is going to feel a little sore on the injection site, but it is going to save their life. And it is very, very important. Um, once EMS has come, they're going to probably want to chat with you a little bit. Um, this is where the Good Samaritan Drug over uh, Good Samaritan Drug Protection Overdose Protection Act Overdose Protection Act um, comes in because if I am currently using drugs and I have drugs on me, I'm not going to be arrested unless I am doing something else that the police don't like. Um, there, there are a bunch of different reactions that people coming out of a substance poisoning could expect. There could be fear, there could be anger, because this human being just, they spent all of their time, all of this time trying to get their drugs. They took their drugs, they went into a poisoning, and now you've essentially removed their high because the naloxone is in their mind, <laughs> is in their brain, and they can't feel the effects of those drugs anymore. So even if they take more, they can't, um, they can't go back under the influence. So there could be anger, there could be fear, you know, they're in a new situation, someone standing over them, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, that's all, you know, it's all within the realm of possibility and everyone is different. Um, 
one thing to note is that they're going to, when people are angry, they might not want to go with EMS. You know, they might want to, um, they might, might want to go out and get other drugs. They might want to run away. They might want to just be alone. All you can do is suggest that they go with EMS. You can be like, hey, my friend, I really want you to go with EMS. If they are refusing, there is nothing you can do. If they are running away in the opposite direction, you've done what you can do. The, the thing is, is that if they have enough opiate in their system and their naloxone wears off, they could go into a secondary poisoning, which is why we always try to recommend if they've got a friend around, we give them a naloxone kit. And then, um, and then if they do go into a secondary poisoning, that friend can help them out. Um, I have got a few more slides on the show, so I'm gonna sk- uh, share my screen again. Um, and we will go from there. Oh, this is, I'm sorry, folks. Okay. Sam, can you see this? Okay. That's awesome everywhere. Do's when responding to an opioid poisoning. Do attend to the person's breathing and cardiovascular supports by administering oxygen or performing rescue breathing and or chest compressions. Again, we can't teach you how to do CPR. We are not medically trained professionals. Um, We can tell you what Alberta Health uh, Services says on this little sheet and on here, but that's all we can do. You know, if you would like to learn more about CPR, um, St. John's Ambulance has some amazing courses, you know, Google it in your local area. Do administer naloxone and utilize a second dose if no response, no response to the first dose. Really, really important. You're going to wait that two minutes and if they're not responding, you're going to naloxone them again. And then you're going to wait that two minutes and if they're not responding, you're going to naloxone them again and again and again. We are seeing, um, I'm looking at it in Calgary right now, we are seeing up to seven vials of naloxone being used to revive someone. You know, it might not be enough um, based on the toxicity level and someone's drug dependency to just use one vial of naloxone. And so we need to be remain vigilant. Do put the person in the recovery position on their side if you must leave the person unattended for any reason. So the recovery. This is only if you're leaving them unattended. Um, This is the recovery position. It's in this little AHS pamphlet um, where they're on their side with one arm out and the other arm underneath their head to cushion it. Um, And this is just in case any vomit or anything comes up um, that they don't choke on their their own bodily fluids. Do stay with the person and keep that person warm. Stay with the person. Don't leave their side until EMS gets there. If you are able to, that's one of the reasons why the Good Samaritan Drug Overdose Protection Act happens, right? You will not be charged. It is really important that you stay with them just in case they don't respond and they need to be in a lock zone again. Don't when responding to an opioid overdose. Um, don't do anything you've ever seen in a movie is pretty much what this slide is. Do not slap or forcefully try to stimulate the person. It can only cause further injury. You know, kick their foot, move their body a little bit with their foot. Don't slap them, just don't do it. It's just going to harm them and it's not going to wake up. If you can't wake the person up by shouting, again, I I don't do the sternum rub, um, because it's just a very vulnerable area. Death grip, right here. The person might be unconscious. If you can't wake them up, you're going to administer the naloxone. Again, it's not going to harm them. Do not put a person in a cold bath or shower. Don't do it. They could go into shock. They could fall. They could drown. Don't do it. 
do not inject any personal substances, any substances, so stimulants. You know, um, Sam did talk, I, you talked about speedballing, right? So an upper and a down are going together. Do not, do not um, cross each other out. They do not cause equilibrium. What actually happens is there's a huge amount of pressure put on the heart because these two forces are fighting within your body. Um, and it is actually incredibly dangerous to do. So please do not inject anyone with substances under the, um, under the opinion that that might even them out from the opioids that they took. The only safe and appropriate treatment um, for a substance poisoning is naloxone because it's not gonna harm them if they're not in a poisoning. All it's gonna do is save their life. Do not make the person vomit drugs that may have been swallowed. Um, it could um, it could make them choke on their own vomit. Don't do it. Um, if you again, it's naloxone. That is what you do until EMS arrives. Last but not least, um, you know you you might not know how you're going to react to uh, an opio uh, to an opioid poisoning. You know, you might feel a myriad of emotions. Nothing will ever go as you plan. And sometimes you have to be, you have to be prepared to feel sadness, anger, upset, sorrow, all of these different things. Nothing is textbook and all accidental substance poisonings are different. So even if you've done one before, the next one you might feel something different. One of the things that I like to do for myself is I get like overly like, blah, 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 like I get hyperactive. I need to remind myself to slow down and take deep breaths. It is so much more important to move with intention and just be a little bit slower than possibly mess up a step. We recommend here at Aware to have a self-care plan to deal with your own emotions after responding to a traumatic event. Um, a self-care plan is for um, when you encounter a crisis situation, sometimes our minds can't cope. You know, we don't know how to deal with the crisis at hand and we actually don't know what our coping mechanisms are. And so a self-care plan is a pre-written out step-by-step -step plan of how you're going to take care of yourself in a crisis. So it's going to include, uh, include coping skills that you use that are healthy, ways to distract yourself, safe people you can call and say, hey, I'm really struggling, crisis line numbers, and ways that you can keep yourself and um, your space safe. Please reach out for help connect with your supports, and know whatever the outcome is, you did what you could, okay? This, as substance poisoning, if you were the resp one responding with naloxone, you are attempting to save this person's life, okay? You do what you can, and not every outcome is going to be what we want it to be. So that's really, really important to note. Um, if you do any want, uh, with, if you would like to come out um, and volunteer with us, if you would like to, you know, learn more, you can always visit our um, our website, and we can direct you from there further. Um, these are some resources. All of them are up on our website. Uh, I hope y'all enjoyed yourselves. I know this was a long presentation, but it's really important that we delve into as much of the background of the information as the actual naloxone training itself to build that compassion, empathy, dignity, and respect. Sam, would you like to say anything before we head out? I think you covered it. It's really great. I appreciate everyone that um, took the time to be a part of this and I hope that we were able to answer some of your questions. Yeah and if you do have any other questions please follow us on all of our social media platforms or visit our website. Sam is also she conducts outreach at downtown Red Deer. What days? Uh, Mondays, Tuesdays uh, and Thursdays. So if you see Sam out and about, give her a thumbs up, 
or if you would like to volunteer with Sam and her team, go to the website. Thank you so much, y'all. Thanks. Well, thank you guys so much. This presentation was so um, enlightening, useful, and we really thank you guys for taking the time here. Um, so thank you so much for coming. Absolutely. Thank y'all so much for having us. Yes. Awesome. All okay, right. Have a great day. Bye. Take care.